Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Fatima Makawi. I am so, so, so thrilled to be here. Um, I have to say, out of all the things that I could be doing today, I'm super, super excited to be here with you guys. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do is this uh, program, and so I just want to say thank you for spending your Sunday morning with me. Happy Father's Day to all of your dads. Um, and if it's okay, can we just, I'd love to know who's in the room. Maybe we'll do a quick kind of roll call if everybody could just, we'll start over here and kind of go through everyone's names. Sweet. So maybe introduce yourself and a fun fact about you. Um, hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Hadra Hassan. And a fun fact about me. Um, Is the mic on? Yeah. Okay. Just put it close to you. So in case the student's on the. Okay. Yeah. yeah so there you go. That. Um, a fun fact about me is that, um, I really know, well, I enjoy reading, so. Okay. What book are you reading right now? I'm not currently reading any books, but. But you enjoy it? Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Sweet. Nice to meet you. Um, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. My name is, uh, my name is Sara, but my name tag says Nuha. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, a fun fact about me is um, I used to have a pet chicken that I named after my mom. Oh, I love that. Nice to meet you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Madiha, and I like um, decorating cakes in my free time, and I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. Great. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Zara. Um, a fun fact about me is I love baking. Really, we have some bakers in here. Love it. Nice to meet you. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Aisha, and a fun fact about me is that um, I like sushi. <laughs> so do I. Great um, choice. My name is Zara, and a fun fact about me is that I like painting. Oh, I love that. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, my name is Halima, and one fun fact about me is I love cats. Oh, nice. So do I. Um, my name is Rabia, and I like baking. Sorry, Rabia, a little bit louder. What's your fun fact? I like baking. Baking? Okay, great. Um, my name is Jenna, and I love playing basketball in my free time. You love what? Basketball. Oh, basketball. Very cool. Nice to meet you. Um, hi, my name is Samara, and my fun fact is that um, I was born in Canada. Oh, very cool. That's awesome. <laughs> my name is Musa, and a fun fact about me is I enjoy painting. I enjoy painting. You're what? I enjoy painting. Oh, nice. Okay, my name is Hassan, and I like martial arts. Nice. Assalamu uh, my name is Muhammad, and I like biking. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ais, and I like to go on runs in my free time. Nice. I love all these activities. Are you still thinking about yours? <laughs> math. <laughs> well, what's your Cass. name? <laughs> Cass? I said math. Coward? Okay. <laughs> Wait, what's your name? Hamza Ali. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> nice to meet you. Assalamu <laughs> um, alaikum. My name is Yusuf Perwez. Uh, and my brother operated a flamethrower once. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where he did it, but it makes me really proud. So that's my fun. Uh, that's a great fun fact. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Zane, and I like playing soccer. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Rayan, and I like playing basketball. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Jabriel, and I like playing soccer. Nice. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Safwan, and I like playing football. Cool. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yahya, and I like playing volleyball. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Harun, and I don't play sports. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Mohammed, and uh, I play soccer. Nice. 
Awesome. Thank you guys so much. It's always so good to see kind of who's in the room and what you guys like to do outside of, outside of these walls. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. My name is Fatima, um, as, as I mentioned. Um, my fun fact is that um, I was born in Belgium, so I guess that's fun because a lot of people don't know that about me. Um, but I've been a part of CARES, gosh, I was 17 years old, so it's been 16 years. It's one of my absolute favorite organizations. Um, I started at, with MYLP. Um, if you guys have heard of that program, which is incredible, highly recommend it. Um, and I'm super, super excited to be um, here with you guys. I'm originally from um, the Midwest, moved out here, went to Berkeley, and now um, I work in the Silicon Valley. So very much into tech, but love all things arts, spoken word, um, and anything that's involving community. Um, and just getting a chance to talk to the youth. I feel like this is where the future is. So thank you for inspiring us. And I'm so excited for today's session because it's a very, 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 very important topic. It's something that's super near and dear um, to our hearts, navigating privilege. And we have a really, really cool exercise um, and series of kind of discussion items. Um, so I'm glad you guys kind of got comfortable with the mic and you know got to start speaking because I definitely want to hear your voices. I want this to be super collaborative. This is not meant to be a lecture. I want to learn from you just as much as you guys learn from us. Um, so please don't be shy and you know pass the mic as much as we can. Um, and in that spirit, there are some housekeeping rules. Um, I know you guys have gone through this, but just as a reminder, let's respect everybody. Let's make sure that the space is safe for everyone. Um, let's keep an open mind, right? We all come fair, from various backgrounds, um, various thoughts and beliefs. We want to make sure everyone feels heard um, and feels seen. And of course, kindness, positivity, curiosity, attentiveness, um, empathy, no judgment zones, right? Big, big, big on that, especially when we're talking about something as heavy as privilege, right? Something that's that's incredibly dense to unpack. And then um, last but not least, please speak up. So again, this is meant for you guys. Um, this is your time. And I want to make sure it's just as much uh, value to you all. So give me live feedback. If something doesn't resonate, we can move on and we can double click on anything that you guys want to kind of um, unpack further. But I'm super, super excited. Um, we're going to start with our very first activity. But before that, any questions, comments, suggestions, anything you guys want to add uh, to the next two hours together? So it's a 10 out of 10. Great. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so as I mentioned, today is all about navigating privilege. and. The main objective is for us to examine how various systems of domination um, and asymmetries of power play out in our daily lives. We want to understand how we may be on a victim of a system of oppression, but also while at the same time inadvertently perpetuate or benefit from other systems of domination in our life. You know that's a lot. We're going to talk about what that means. Um, but before that, the second main one is to understand privilege and practice acknowledging it. So we want to identify privileges that we possess or don't possess, and then note the invisibility of those privileges through various exercises. And so our very first one is going to be an activity where we're going to count groups of five. So I'll start with my brother here. So just say one, and we'll kind of go through. Um, so one, two, and then we'll break up, and then we'll give you guys kind of some supplies, and then I'll explain what we're going to do with those supplies. So, you guys ready? Awesome. We're going to go straight. Oh, sorry. Who said sex? You said sex? We start back at one. There's no sex. You did it right. Yeah, yeah. So you're one? Great. And you're two? Three? Oh, my god. That never happens. We're even. All right. Let's find, do you want to tell everybody where the groups are going to lay out? So let's kind of break out into different areas. So we can have one, group one up here, and then group two. Sweet.
All right, so as you guys get to your activity groups, sorry, let me get the mic a little bit closer so folks on the line can hear. You will all be given some supplies, and these supplies are to make a tower. You can make a tower however you'd like. It can look like whatever you want it to be, but we're going to co-create a tower, and we will spend, we'll do, we'll give you guys like 10 minutes, and, um, you know, Osman, myself, and I, and some of the other facilitators will be helping um, just make sure your tower looks good. And ready, set, go. All right, if you were in group one that was sitting right here, please stand up. Group one. All right, group one, what supplies did you guys have? And anybody can answer. Just uh, raise your hand so that we know who, where to send the mic to. Uh, we had um, frosting and a plate, a Ziploc bag with the noodles, and a plastic spoon. Am I missing anything? No? Okay. And your spaghettis were cooked, no? They were cooked, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and someone else in the group. Um, yeah, thank you, Usman, for cooking those. The cop cooked them. Um, Someone else explain to me, what, it, what was it like to be tasked with building a tower with cooked noodles? And were they melted marshmallows? They were melted marshmallows. Frosting. Oh, even better. <laughs> they can't even stick. <laughs> um, it kind of forced us to be creative and like try to figure out what works to stay, stay upright and then Obviously, dealing with losing resources was the bigger problem, more yeah. so than like figuring out we would stand up. Did any of it feel unfair? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I think um, as we lost <laughs> tools, it, it was definitely unfair. I think we, yeah. we, we, we felt pretty confident at the beginning, but then just losing tools definitely undermined confidence. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment before we move on to group two? Thank you, group one. You guys can sit down. Thank you for sharing. Group two, if you can stand up. And group two, what supplies did you guys have? Do you want to talk in the mic? Uh, we had the same thing as group one, the cooked spaghetti, frosting, plate, and a spoon. OK. And how was it building a tower with those supplies? Uh, it was pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else in the group want to share kind of what it felt like to to build a tower? <laughs> it felt like I was trying to build a tower out of mush. Mm. Did that feel fair? No. Yeah. Did you know what the other groups had? Could you see? Yeah, that probably felt worse, huh? <laughs> it is what it is, yeah. Group three, three, stand up, please. Group three, what supplies did you guys have? Was it the same thing? We had marshmallows and a dream. <laughs> did you say a dream? I love that, okay. How did, how did it feel to have a dream in marshmallows? Not as well as you'd think. <laughs> okay. Um, and someone else in the group, did any of that feel kind of fair? What did, you, what did it feel like at the beginning, maybe towards the end? Did you guys take a sneak peek into what other groups had? If you don't volunteer yourself, I will. Yes. What was the question? Um, what did it feel like? Did you feel like it was unfair? Could you tell what other people had? Um, it was unfair, and we saw the huge tower. <laughs> so it was really From unfair. From group five? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And then I believe we're group four. Group four, stand up. Did you guys have the same supplies as group three? 
Yeah? Okay. How did that feel? Go ahead. Um, not fair at all. Yeah. Were there any moments where some of the actors in the room kind of played a role or didn't? Uh, yeah, sort of. Yeah? Who played a role? Um, Did someone say something about what you can and can't do? Yeah, but like, can someone else speak about it? Can someone what? <laughs> someone else speak oh, about sure. it. Oh, <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> we have one up here. <laughs> Um, we definitely got a lot of comments saying that our structure wasn't good enough and it was sad compared to the other structures when we didn't have enough materials. Yeah. And then what did that feel like? It was bad. Yeah. Didn't like it, yeah. That doesn't feel good. Yeah, because we worked pretty hard and then it yeah. was a little too Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That was great assessment. Last but not least, group five. What did you guys have? Um, so we had spaghetti, marshmallows, um, a whole box of cutlery. Um, we got more marshmallows as time went on, more spaghetti, words of encouragement. Um, we also got to hold our structure because it was falling apart. Um, despite having all those materials, we weren't very good at utilizing them. Hmm. And it looks like you had a whole box. Right, we had multiple boxes and tin foil. Yeah. Lots and I heard someone secretly gave you more supplies. Yeah, he was actually collecting supplies and giving them to yeah. us. <laughs> and what kind of words of affirmation did you get? Um, ours is the best. <laughs> and we had to win. Yeah. Yeah. Did, what did that feel like? Did you notice anybody else had stuff? Well, we noticed that other people had less stuff. At first, we didn't notice. And then one of my group mates mentioned that they had cooked spaghetti over there mm. and something that looked like frosting. Yeah. It, it felt kind of bad, actually, because they were doing better than us. Yeah. But you kept going. Yes. So, yeah, because someone was telling you keep producing, right? Yes. Yeah. We had lots of words of affirmation. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. All right. Anybody else, group five? I would love to hear another voice. Yeah, we got one right here. Sorry, who raised their hand? Um, I think all in all, you know, we had like everything given to us. So uh -huh. we had like a really bad work ethic. So the fact that we had like so many resources, but still like didn't make the best use of it. I think that was because like everything was given to us so we didn't really have to work as hard. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. You guys can sit down. So yeah, I, you guys like crushed it. That's exactly right. I mean, that's exactly the kind of experience, right? Different groups, you know, live every single day. We actually had three different roles that were invisibly playing different um, aspects of society. So did anybody get something taken away from them or like told that like, oh, sorry, you no longer have access to this X, Y, Z. For example, I know group one had cooked spaghetti, which is already hard to work with. You guys made an incredible infrastructure built on this hope for like, hey, we're going to try our best, and then what happened? The cop came and took away your permit that you didn't even know about and slashed half of it, which wasn't really half. It was three-fourths, and then you had to start all over, right? Versus group five, there was the capitalist. There was the person that was kind of just like, let's go, let's go. Hey, wh why is that person not working? Like, let's put them to work. Hey, I secretly got you this, and then... You had the entire infrastructure, the entire system working for you. And as you mentioned, right, um, you kind of worked a little less, right? You were like, oh, well, I have this privilege. Maybe I could slant it a little bit more. Maybe I could hold it. Maybe it's not a big idea or a big deal to kind of sit there on top of a, a box, right, which was like where all of the supplies, everyone's supplies 
was being carried in. And then you had the comments, right? Like you, exactly right. Like there are people who are supposed to be the structure of capitalism saying, that's not good enough. Like why isn't it as good as that? And you're just like, because I don't have the same access and the same privilege, right? The same, the same stuff. And I'm trying so hard. And every time I try, someone tells me to work harder. And I feel like I'm just running myself out, right? Is that what that felt like? And that doesn't feel good. Is it motivating? What did that make you want to do? Just give up, right? And then at the same time, people are like, have everything or being like, you're doing a great job, like amazing. And then there were the folks in the middle who had a little bit of each, right? And they got some favoritism, but they would got the sense of false hope, right? And I think you, one of, one of you guys said it, right? You were like, oh, we, it's the guy that said I had a marshmallows in a dream, right? Literally, we tried to create that American dream built into that. And I just think that this conversation and this workshop and this exercise is so, so meaningful. It's actually, um, it's called the Tower of Power. And it was borrowed from a partnership program between Care LA and the Japanese American allies in the LA area. Um, and it really is meant to kind of put people through the motions. And, you know, the truth is, it's like, it's hard to do these activities because I know Asman, I mean, poor guy, he was like, this is so uncomfortable, you know, to act as the person that's taking. Um, but it really, it really signifies how you could be both a beneficiary of privilege, but also be a victim all at the same time, right? Especially as, um, as many of us, um, you know, in terms of like where we come from and our families and whatnot. So I want to kind of go through some of these key principles with you all, but thank you so much for kind of the vulnerability and allowing yourself to go through these motions. I know they're not necessarily comfortable. And for some, maybe they, even like you mentioned it, even the, amount of access you had and privilege was uncomfortable because you were like, but everybody else doesn't have this, but you kept going, right? Because the system was like, no, you have to win. You have to go. You have to go. So even folks who are on the other side, right, could definitely feel that and that's uncomfortable. So I, I just think that we're constantly living this battle of where do we fit and then how do we ensure that we're, you know, building a life of equity, right? Um, so any questions so far? Does that kind of make sense? Did you feel like halfway through you kind of knew why we were doing this? I felt like you guys were super smart. You caught on pretty quickly. But any questions? Does this resonate? Yeah. Um, so, like, I kind of came here late. So <laughs> I don't know if I missed this, but... And what group were you in? I was in group one. Okay. Should have been group five, but... <laughs> um, my question is like, why why does it matter as much? Because you know, like I don't mean to be like a sheikh or an imam or anything like that, but aren't we all gonna like you know die or something like that? We're all getting tested. Mm -hmm. So why does it matter if someone is tested with poverty and someone is like tested with like wealth? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you're just gonna die. It just depends on what you use that wealth for. I think you answered your question. That's exactly no, it. Then, it's yeah. what you use your wealth for. How do you lend privilege? How do you lend access? How do you create more access? Um, there are people who can have access and privilege and then keep it all to themselves, right? Or you can open up one door, which open up 10, and then that's how generational wealth and generational access and privilege gets created and formed, right? You, it, I think it's incredible how it's, first of all, that's an amazing question, mm -hmm. and I, it's ex extremely relevant, right? Um, because we, what you're basically talking about is permanence, right? This idea of like, we don't live forever. Like, none of this comes with us. What's the point? But then you literally said, except to use it for good, right? And that's the, I think that's the point. Now, a lot of what we talked about today was visible. You can see it. You can feel it. It's obvious. If I have a million dollars in the bank account, it's obvious that I have a million dollars more than a lot of people, right? I'm, I'm sorry, brother. What was your name? Yasin. Right? If I have a million dollars, I can see it. I know that I have a million dollars more than a lot, of pe a lot of other people, right? But what about things like skin tone, right? Like being racially ambiguous might get me into spaces that other people may not get into. 
or um, where you know my heritage comes from, or so many things that are more, um, I would say, nuanced or invisible. If I don't do the self work to recognize the privilege that I have, then I become personally just as bad as someone who has it and can see it and doesn't give it, right? Or doesn't lend it. And I think that this is why we do this work because it's not just about what you can see, but what you can't see, right? So I'm Algerian um, and I have a lot of privilege just living in America. And yes, my family might have XYZ and you know maybe there's this that my white coworkers don't have to deal with or have a certain level of wealth that I didn't come with from, you know what I mean? But I also literally have access to jobs and opportunities that many of my cousins do not. So that's a privilege that I could sit in my shell and be like, well, you know, like I'm, I'm the victim here. And so there's different levels here. And so the more and more we see and really look at our, what we have in our lives, the more we can go, okay, I may not have access to all of these things that like white America has, but I have X, Y, Z that if we together, and I loved how groups one and two started working together and <laughs> you guys called it a union, right? Like you're like, we both don't have these supplies, but you had supplies and maybe group zero that was non-existent had no supplies and was told to build a tower. Is that, do, do you guys not know communities who are told to build something out of nothing? Yes, right? And so like there's so many different layers to it. So yes, and that's such a good question. Thank you for asking. And we're going to go through some of that, too, about what some of those invisible privileges can look like. Um, anybody, would anybody else kind of uh, answer that differently? Or anybody else have, like, a kind of different experience about what's the point, right, of acknowledging it? Resonates? Sweet. Awesome. All right. So we did our debrief. I specifically wanted to kind of get to the how does this activity mirror society, right, which we had some dialogue about. I'd love to talk about competition. I waited until the end to say that it was a competition. Is that fair? No. Because you probably were building a tower at leisure. You probably didn't even think that your tower had anything to do with anyone else's tower, right? And then I waited at the end when I knew that group five had built the top, right? And I was supposed to play the role of a capitalist society or, or essentially kind of fueling the privileged groups that had a lot of access. And Usman was, you know, the one taking away the resources. So it was. Yeah. It was super unfair. Who's the one that's talking? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to talk on the mic? <laughs> sure. Because uh, I was taking pictures, right? Yeah. So I was going around and observing the different groups. So yeah, I didn't notice that, like, when they, I was like, how did you guys, you know, build so quickly? Because I was looking at the progress yeah. of every group and observing and just kind of seeing. And I was like, oh, some of them, like, why do they have spaghetti? Yeah. And why don't they have, like, the spaghetti that's, by the way, like, cooked or, and the other ones just had, like, raw spaghetti. So that's like, yeah, it's unfair, right? Yeah. And if you have, if you don't have an adequate amount of resources, um, how are you going to build that? You know, right. how are you going to get that result? So, yeah. Yeah. I also thought it was really powerful to kind of see that there were four groups that didn't have as many supplies as one group. And you, you know, when I said, you know, let's go ahead and take a tour around the neighborhood, all of the groups kind of marched towards group one. And you guys were like, so many of you. And then there was group one, right? And yet no one could do anything, which I think is really powerful because, I mean, I think so much of society is that. There are so many people who are marginalized um, and have lower access than those that do. But yes, the competition part was intentional. We wanted to make sure it was unfair. We wanted to make sure that access to information was delayed, right? I told group one at the beginning that you guys have to win. So they knew it was a competition before everybody else did, which is not fair, right? Access to information. And then we went around and started criticizing other people's towers, almost like they didn't do enough and they weren't good enough, right? Again, not fair, right? Especially when you're in competition. And for some people, it's competition over livelihood, their literal ability to feed their families. 
All right, so does somebody want to read this definition? Privilege. This is unearned access to social rewards, access to resources, benefits, and the power to shape the norms and values of society, which certain people receive unconsciously or consciously by virtue of their identity. For example, male privilege or white privilege. Yep. Any questions on that definition? Do you guys know what the model minority myth is? Has anyone heard of that before? Can we get another volunteer to read this definition? This refers to a minority group, whether ethnic, race, racial, or religious, whose members are most often perceived to achieve a higher degree of success than the population average, measured in income, education, and related factors such as crime rates and family stability. The model minority stereotype is considered detrimental to relevant minority communities because it is used to justify the exclusion of minorities and the distribution of assistance programs, public and private, to understate or slight the achievements of individuals within that minority and to misrepresent the diversity and inequity within that community. Furthermore, the idea of the model minority pits minority groups against each other by implying that non-model groups are at fault for, sh for falling short of the model minority level of achievement and assimilation. So that was big in our exercise, right? So when you had comments about the different groups, well, why can't yours look like that? What, what was happening? It was the pitting of two groups together that didn't have access or had a level of inequity against each other to make it look like, well, what, why are, have you guys not figured this out yet, right? This is extremely, extremely important. And I think a lot of times um, goes over a lot of people's head because it's extremely difficult to understand something unless you've experienced it. And I think this is why this workshop, while I imagine that many of us have had an experience with privilege, either being the victim or a perpetuator of it, right, of some levels, this workshop really helps to kind of illustrate you know, at an innocuous level as it relates to building a tower with marshmallows and spaghetti, what, how even something like that can feel so bad, right? Now imagine it being your career, your future, your education, right? So questions like, um, do you have a quiet place to study for your SATs? That may not be the reality of everybody's, right? Or, you know, is English your first language? What school district do you go to? What access to quality education, tutoring, money, et cetera, et cetera, right? These are all ways in which kind of more relatable to your levels can show up in classrooms. Um, and the model minority, definitely we see it in, in schools as well where, you know, people are pitted against each other. And a lot of ways, you know, the, the system is set up that way too. There's a lot of benefits to, I think, capitalism in that sense, but um, has anybody had an experience of this that you're like, oh my gosh, this, this makes sense, this definition, like, you know when you're experiencing something but someone puts words into it, kind of makes more sense? Do you want to share an experience that either through this exercise or maybe um, in real life? We have one more definition. Great. All right. Can I get one more volunteer? Okay, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that word. <laughs> okay, disaggregation. This is a process which involves looking at and breaking down the individual segments of the larger community that is breaking Muslim community into different ethnic, or racial groups and different classes and gives a much clearer picture of the unique experiences of groups within a broader community. Great. And then before we move on to our last um, exercise here, how do we address unfair access to resources? So if we could redo this entire workshop, what would you do differently to make sure it was equitable? Yes, wait, wait for the mic, sorry.
Uh, I think if we realized what was happening, we try to unionize earlier and like with more groups, all against group one, or even maybe work with them if they were willing to, because like uh, we didn't really think about even banding together until the very end. And I feel like uh, if we could convince everybody to get together, then like what if we could all just be capitalists, you know? <laughs> yeah. What else would you guys do differently? What I noticed was that um, we had a lot more supplies than everyone else, but like in the sense that it was too much for us. So if we had decided to give our supplies to other groups, we still would have had enough for ourselves, mm. but other uh, but other people would have gotten resources too. And and it was pretty selfish of us to not distribute it. But that's, isn't that how that works with capitalism too? People at the top hoard their resources and they don't distribute them and then people are left to suffer. Um, so if you did have that money and that access, then um, giving it away would be a better option than like having a top 10%. Mm. That's a really, really, really great point. That was amazing. Do you have a comment over here? We have one over here. Thank you. That was great. Um, so, like, here's the thing that, like, I've just been realizing, uh, capitalism has been around since, like, the beginning of, like, human history. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, like, how would we even fix privilege? Mm -hmm. How would we even go about it? Because at the end of the day, there's always going to be a group that's going to be higher. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, not everyone's a good person mm -hmm. because people are greedy. So, yeah. how would you even go about fixing that mentality? Mm -hmm. What do you think? On me? Uh, if you were, if it was... I mean, here's the thing, though. I think all of us here, we're all Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. So we already have Islam. That's like our guidelines and our guide rules. But I don't know about, like, <laughs> someone else that's different. Right. So, again, I can't really... Yeah. How, what do you guys think about Yasin's question? You want to else have any answers to that? It's a really good one. I think a lot of people spend their entire life answering. We have one over here. Um, I guess, like, the thing is you can't really control what other people do. Uh, inevitably, you're going to have people who are immoral or greedy, like Yasin. Oh god, like, shut up, <laughs> like Yasin said, and um, what's it called, uh, I think the, be the best that we can really do for that is just work on our individual levels to try and distribute our resources as best we can, because at the end of the day, this stuff, I mean, no form of societal oppression will ever be stricken from society for the rest of history, like, nobody can guarantee that, it's going to keep on coming up, I guess the idea is just, uh, I think that we can just engage with, like, small battles with it that come up in our lives, you know, and mm -hmm. do what we can to uh, eliminate it at any level that, like, we're actually capable of. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else have any thoughts on Yasin's question? Well, Yasin, it is a million-dollar question, no pun intended. <laughs> awesome. All right, we're going to go ahead and flip over to... Um, Wheel of Privilege. You guys want to open that up? Okay, so, and you want to have a pen out? Perfect. So for each identity category on the Wheel of Privilege, we are going to fill in the outer ring with the most powerful group in society. And you can see the index below for the breakdown of the different categories. And we want to identify the most powerful group for each category. So you want to think about kind of two or three um, and then you want to assign the remaining identity categories um, to the rest. So, does everybody have it in front? Yeah, it looks like you guys already started. Okay. So, number one, identify the privileged groups in the U.S. in each segment of the outer ring. 
And you guys, like, know, like, you'll put the U.S. on the one, the outer ring of the ones that apply. So if age, race, ethnicity, you'll put U.S. on there. A little bit quicker for time. So the next one is identify the privileged groups in the Muslim community in each segment of the middle ring. So the most outer was the U.S. Now we're going to just the Muslim community. And then the next ring is your identity. So what privilege do you think that you have? Put like me on that. All right, and then the last one is anything that you have in common, your intersectionality, you want to put a little star or shade it in. You just want to showcase the ones that are um, that intersect. So the U.S., the Muslim community, you and your identity, and then the ones you share. Um, so it's the U.S., the Muslim community, your identity category. So like, um, I'm Algerian, so Arab would be okay. What within the Arab community? What identity privilege? Then it's you yourself you specifically as a person. And then the last one is whichever one intersects, like that there's like a commonality. Does that make sense? Okay, so US, you got that one? The Muslims, okay. What's your nationality? Moroccan, so Arab, right? So that would be within the Arab community. So uh, it's, it's whatever you think the, there's privilege in being Arab, for example. All right, you guys, I'm gonna go around and we're gonna have a conversation. Yes. Mohammed, what did you notice when you did this? Um, sorry, <laughs> I asked you a question before the mic. Thank you so much. I have a lot of rights. <laughs> privilege. Privilege. What do you mean by that? What did you notice? What kind of privilege do you have? About like in the US, I, I do have privilege because you know, I was born here, so I have citizenship here, and mm -hmm. um, I'm speaking uh, to the mic. And I have, and I speak English, and I'm not like disabled, and um, it's like I could pass as like a white guy or whatever. And the age, not so much, but I just realized that because it's the U.S., there's all these factors do affect like how, what kind of privileges you have. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing for the Muslim community, like even though it kind of shouldn't be like that, there's still like the what you are can also affect the kind of privileges you have. So that's what I can read. That's incredible. That's exactly right, Mohammed. You just crushed the entire workshop. That's exactly it, right? It's this idea of like, Yassine, you brought it up, right? What do you do with all of that once you realize you have it? So Mohammed, I turn to you. Okay, you just did this exercise. You go, oh my God, I have a lot of privilege. What do you do with that? And so that's what our next section is going to be is allyship, right? Lending it. Anything else you guys noticed? Sorry, my mic keeps going off me. It looks like, okay, you shaded. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of commonalities. Do you mind sharing? Okay. Uh, so I thought, yeah, like shaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did it right. Yeah, yeah. You did a great job. I shaded in like gender, age, race. And put the mic towards your mic. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. I shaded in gender, age, race, class, language, ability status, and citizenship because those are all things that like affect what you do day to day in the yeah. US. Yeah. And then for the Islamic community, I didn't shade in citizenship. Yeah. Because they don't really look at that as much since a lot of people here are immigrants. Yeah. But they do look at the other ones the same. Yeah. I really get to the personal one. Yeah. Great job. Crushed it. Can we get someone on this side? Was any of this surprising when you started shading? Any of it not surprising? Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Naha. Um, so I guess it wasn't all that surprising because in our day-to-day -day life, we are aware of some things. Mm. Like every time there's an election, 
we always know that the president will probably be an old white guy. No offense to old white guys, but um, <laughs> it's, it's just the privilege they have is that they're seen as authority, like authority mm-hmm. figures mm-hmm. and um, they're most likely wealthy. And yeah, as, as a female person of color, you probably know that you're going to have to work harder because people won't view you as, as an authority figure or someone who will get as far in life as other people. Mm-hmm. And the age is something you don't really think about because, I mean, we're, we're all teenagers here. Um, and, but we do know that Sometimes people older than us will have more authority over us. Mm -hmm. But as you grow older, it's less apparent. But it's still there. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, but race and ethnicity is a very big one here in the U.S. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Naha. I appreciate it. All right. So um, that's just another different kind of lens at everything that we've been talking about leading up to this point. So um, I appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate you guys doing this. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, right? Um, I know it's not always a great feeling to kind of see that, but it, I think it also can be empowering. I go back to Yassine's point at the beginning. What do you do with it, right? So we're going to move on to the next section. I know we only have 20 minutes left, but um, we're going to hear a story from the CETA. And as you listen to the story, I want you to think about social justice, allyship, and privilege. So, does everybody have the story in front of them? Great. Can I get a volunteer to read it? And uh, they're going to pass the mic over. Make sure you are loud and clear. The Prophet ﷺ witnessed an incident when he was about 20 years old before the coming of the revelation. A man from Yemen came to Mecca to do some trading. He struck a deal with Qurayshi Meccan, who told him to pass the merchandise he had brought and he would make the payment the next day. When his man came to collect the payment, the Qurayshi dismissed his request and said, I don't know what you're talking about. The man went around for different leaders to get help, but at the time, your loyalty to your tribe, your loyalty was to your tribe and not to truth or justice. The man went to a gathering of leaders at the Kaaba and called out, uh, called out for men of honor and dignity to help him. A group of them came together and decided they needed to help this man who had been taken advantage of. They made a pact known as Hilf al-Fudul, Pact of Virtue, which stated that they will support the rights of all the oppressed, even if it's an outsider. The pact also stated that they would oppose the oppressor, even if he's one of the Quraysh. They approached the Quraysh man who robbed the merchant and demanded he return the goods. Looking back at this incident, the Prophet ﷺ said, If I was called to take part in that pact today, with Islam and Sharia established, I would go. Jazakallah khair. That was a beautiful reading of the story. Um, while we're still actually on you, since you have the mic, so sorry if we could pass it back to him. Um, in the context of what we've been discussing today, what does that teach you about um, what our dean says about privilege and what that looks like? What was the first thought after you were done reading the story? We were like, whoa. Like, uh, the first thing I, the first thought thing I thought was, mashallah, even back then, he still had a lot of privileges. Mm-hmm. Maybe even more than we have now. Maybe less. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Any thoughts on that story? Great. And if I can have someone read the definition of, I guess allyship didn't come up. Oh, perfect. Oh, well, I'll read it since it's right next to me. So um, we're going to conclude by kind of what we, what we think is um, the best kind of next step or next course of action, right, is to be an ally. This is what you do with privilege. And what that means is an ally is a member of the dominant or majority group who questions or rejects the dominant ideology and works against oppression through support of and as an advocate with or for the oppressed population, which was exactly what was exemplified in the story that we just read from the Sita. And that is 
at the end be all, what we do with things that we have access to and don't. And I, what I think is amazing about this definition is when we were talking about how would we, would we reimagine this workshop, someone in the um, class said, well, honestly, I would probably, uh, I think it was, it was you in the middle. Um, what's your name again, brother? I want to make sure you get credit for this. Is it Sultan? Safan? Safan, you said, um, well, if I knew, honestly, I would have just like, at the beginning, figured out a way how to collaborate and work together and reimagine what a society looks like when we're co-creating things together. And then you're able to remove um, blocks and barriers. And then to supplement that is Noah's point of, well, hey, I was a part of the majority or dominant group. If I had known, I would have probably questioned or rejected the dominant ideology and worked against oppression, which, Noha, it's insane how that's exactly the definition that you had already said an hour ago, which is incredible. So um, I, I would love to get quick rapid fire examples of ways that you can be an ally today. So I know Mohammed had mentioned a couple of his privileges and kind of things that he realized, oh wow, like I actually had access to this. What are some quick ways that you can be an ally for another community um, that you know you may have privilege then and they don't? I would love this for it to be rapid fire because we are in the last 15 minutes. So if you look at the wheel, one of them that you saw was language, and we all know English here. And there's so many people who don't, and there's people who start like ESL programs and stuff like that that makes them an ally for people who are oppressed for not knowing English. That's amazing. Yep, helping folks out, lending a hand, volunteering. Sometimes it's even just seeing and acknowledging that it's harder, right? Some, some people just want to be seen, right? And then what do you do with that? So fun? Wait for the mic. Thank you so much for sharing. I guess also just like mentally reaffirming in yourself and understanding that you have uh, the privileges that you do and like... Um, like, and making sure that you're not quick to judge people who might not have those privileges. Because a lot of times, uh, it's really unfortunate, but people will call, I don't know, like uh, if there's someone in school who doesn't know English or something as well, they'll call them stupid or mm -hmm. something, right? And they'll, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, sh sh look, look down upon them. But like then you also have to remember that that person is probably just as smart as you are. They just didn't get the same opportunity mm -hmm. or, um, you know, stuff like that. So it's just reaffirming that mentally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. I think it segues into a couple of tips and guidelines for being an ally. Um, number one, recognize that being an ally is a process, not an end goal, right? You're not chasing this title. I'm an ally. That's not the point. The point is to be there, right? Truly be there for the process. Um, secondly, and this is super important, being an ally requires you to learn the narratives of the oppressed population. And I would further add from the oppressed population, right? Even if you know a lot about something, you want to hear it from the person that's actually experiencing it, right? Because I think that's where unconscious bias or our own personal narrative can take a spin and we can then recreate someone else's narrative for them, which is not okay. Number three, you shouldn't identify yourself as an ally unless the oppressed population has recognized you as one. This helps eliminate this idea of running around town and claiming, you know, um, that you're an ally for this group, and um, it then becomes kind of a, a contest of, you know, doing work that's just something that feels good for you and not really about the about the mission or the goal of what the community um, that you're trying to be an ally to um, is expressing. There are several steps an ally can take to carry out their role more effectively, and so I want to leave you guys with this. Live with awareness of the world around them, right? So allies are constantly aware and conscious of what's going on around them. Number two, think critically about the world. So this goes back to questioning, right? We don't just accept, but we think, we ask questions. Yasin, I appreciated you asking questions, right? and kind of challenging the space a little bit. I think that's exactly what you should be doing, always and often. Number three, educate yourself on the histories and experiences of target groups from the target groups. 
Interrupt prejudiced behavior. So when you see something that's not okay, you need to call it out, right? That's what an ally would do. And then last but not least, take action by deciding what needs to be done and then following through. It's not enough to be an ally by tongue, by words, but by action, right? So you want to do, you don't want to just see something or an injustice happening in front of you and then bear witness to it, right? You want to do something about it. So these are just kind of some allyship tips and guidelines. Um, you know, I know we have about, you know, eight minutes left. I'd love for kind of any last thoughts um, on either the exercise or some of the definitions we went through or the story that we shared. Um, what did you guys think? Kind of was this... Did you learn something new that you kind of didn't know before you came? I'd love to hear kind of some feedback. I just got like one question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we choose the um, right allies? Because, you know, there's a lot of oppressed groups out there, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily like right. So how do we like go about choosing the right people to help? Yeah. Support? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think that answer is going to vary person to person, right? Um, I think by no means um, is this workshop intended to say this is the group or this is what you should be doing or saying. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, you know, about what feels true to you um, and what that community needs, right? Um, and I think sometimes, a lot of times I would say there's a lot of oppression Olympics, right, where there are a bunch of communities and they're all oppressed. And it's all about whose oppression is more. And I just, I think it's not a, it's not a question of whose is more, but, you know, what do these communities individually need? And then how can we allocate resource access and privilege? In the same way we thought about these supplies and creating these towers, how do we then distribute that? So it's a great question. And I also think that it's a personal one. And I think it depends. And I also think it's contextual. And I... I think the best start is to start. And through your process, because again, allyship is a process, not an end goal, you'll learn so much. I have learned so much learning how to be an ally for different communities that I may not have known a ton about. And honestly, I've done things that are like probably lots of le lessons to be learned. And that's okay. That's a part of learning. It's a part of the process. Um, and it's a part of, you know, you want to be vulnerable because I think that's, where you can authentically show up for people. It's not about showing up and being kind of the like savior. These communities don't need to be saved by anybody and certainly not by those who are privileged. So it's about by just being there and, and um, holding space sometimes. So it's a really good question. This is just as much, yeah, this is just as much um, of an experience for us as it was for you guys, um, especially as we played different roles. Um, Oh my gosh, I still feel, I don't know about you, Usman, I still feel uncomfortable about the role that, that we played. Yeah, it's not a good one. Um, and it makes me think about, you know, the ways in which I'm also um, experiencing and um, kind of puts me in, in, into a uh, question of like, how are you lending your privilege? Because I definitely have a lot of it. So, um, well, I... Thank you guys so, so, so much. It took a lot of courage to show up. It took a lot of courage to be involved in this workshop. I know a lot of the stuff that we talk about, you know, while um, we were playing with supplies, they're super, the underlying message is really heavy and it's, it's massive and it's honestly so much to pack in two hours. Don't let this be the only time, right, that you're exploring this, this um, the world of, oppression and privilege and charity versus justice and the minority um, model. I, I personally just feel super honored to share this space. And I thank you guys um, for also allowing us to kind of play the roles. Um, I know it wasn't always comfortable. So, um, but yeah, that's all I have for you guys. Oh my God, I hate the end. <laughs> yeah, can we give a quick round of applause for Fatima real quick? Oh, thank you guys.